Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here today. It's so lovely to have you here for the last webinar of season nine, which is a little bit crackers, but also one that I'm very, very excited about. So thank you all so much for being here. So today our guest is Iman Ismail. Uh, I've been practicing, uh, a founder of Iman Copy Co, host of the absolutely, absolutely brilliant uh, Mistakes That Made Me podcast. Like, if I can make one recommendation, it would be to open up your, your podcast player right now and find Mistakes That Made Me. Uh, very, very, very good listen. And uh, freelance magazine cover star. We've got a magazine uh, from Cover Star here today, everyone. Uh, to, today, we're focusing on freelancing and how to smash it to pieces. Uh, it's not an easy job out there. So I feel like today is going to be part education, probably part therapy. Uh, that's certainly where my brain is at today. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Today will function as a presentation and then we'll have a Q&A uh, for Nicola in the chat. The name of the podcast again is Mistakes That Made Me. Uh, very, very good. Uh, the session will function today as a presentation and then we'll have Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, do drop it in the Q&A feature, which is found down below. Uh, we'll take questions after the presentation element. Uh, today's featured sponsor is Storyblock. Um, and like... The way that I've been thinking about Storyblock recently, so Storyblock are a CMS, you know, so if you think of WordPress as your traditional CMS, then Storyblock have come in and, and they've really started to shake things up. And I never really used to think about my CMS decisions. I just like bang a website up on, on WordPress and off we go type of thing. But Storyblock recently commissioned a study uh, to see how effective uh, their CMS was versus other folks and, 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 and in themselves. And they found a 582% ROI and three times productivity boost from using that CMS, which is ridiculous because I never really thought of CMS as a big decision, but it totally is. So very much worth checking out Storyblock. They're very, very cool. Uh, I also want to say a big thank you to Impression, Redgate, Cambridge Marketing College and Brand Recruitment. Every one of these are phenomenal sponsors. And as we come to the close of season nine, it's just a moment to say thanks very much to our sponsors because without them we won't be able to do what we do uh nicole in the chat has said thank you sponsors and we mean that with sincerity they're an important part of the community as are all of you who have decided to turn up today uh and Suze, yes i do have new specs thank you for noticing that's really cool with all that said uh now is the time uh to uh, get going so man thank you so much for being here today you're absolutely wicked i'm so excited um and it's over to you Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Let me just get my screen up. I have to say, yeah, my designer, uh, my branding designer, Kaylee Lloyd, she's amazing. So shout out to Kaylee Lloyd. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. I am here to talk about how to kick ass as a freelancer. So in case you don't know who I am. <laughs> My name is Iman Ismail, and thank you, Joe, for getting the pronunciation right and for just giving it a go. I appreciate that. I am an email strategist and copywriter, so that's a long-winded way of saying I help my clients make money through email, but it's also not about just making money through email. It's really about strengthening that relationship with subscribers and nurturing them, creating, you know, those um, generally lifecycle automated email sequences that get them good results. I'm also a podcast host. Like Joe said, my podcast is called Mistakes That Made Me. It's the podcast that asks extraordinary business owners to share their biggest business mistake. And I'm also a mama of two. And I always like to say that when I introduce myself, because I want you to know the context behind everything that I'm sharing today. So I have built a business that allows me to be, you know, the mom that I want to be to my two kids. I don't have all the time in the world, my time, my energy, my like brain is limited. And so that's the context with which, um, you know, we're working and any tips that I give you, any advice that I'm giving you, you know, should just consider the fact that I don't expect you, your business to be the only thing that you have in your life. I know that we all have a million and one things going on. So these are some of the businesses uh, that I've worked with that I've written emails for and other stuff for and 
let me, I want to go back a little bit and tell you a bit about my story, uh, where I've come from and why on earth you should even like, listen to me. Who, who am I for you to even take advice from? Right. (laughs) So back in 2018, I was working at a charity and a small charity and I was running the communications department. And I say running the communications department because I was the only person in that department. And so I was doing a bit of everything. I decided to quit that job. Um, I had a two-year-old son at the time, just the one at that back then. And I decided to quit for lots of reasons. Um, there was a lot of travel involved, not a lot of pay involved. Um, and so I, I decided that I really wanted to be more in charge of my timetable, my schedule, my life. Um, I remember at one point my son, I mean, my son was two at the time, so he was constantly getting sick at nursery. And I remember asking my manager if I could take some time out that morning to take my son to the doctors. And I just remember thinking, in what world do I have to ask somebody else to take my son to the doctors? It just seemed completely ludicrous to me. So I decided I was going to leave. And I did. I had no savings, no backup job, and a two-year-old to feed. Uh, Left that job on a Friday. By the Monday, I had my copywriting business which I'd always wanted to start, but had failed. I tried to start it and failed two times before. So this was my third try, right? This, this was my third try. It had to work because I had a son at this point. I started off charging 15 pounds an hour, had no clue how to run a business, was just kind of trying to make it work. I remember my, my months being filled with client work and just, and making like 1,500 pounds at the end of the month and thinking, I don't have any more capacity to take on more clients, but I'm earning very little money doing this. There's something so wrong. I don't know where I'm going wrong. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I just know that something is wrong. By 2020, um, I had figured things out a little bit more. I was still in feast and famine mode, if we're being completely honest. You know, my I think my highest month at that point was probably 5K, but there were still months where I made very little. But, you know, it was it was OK. It was happening. Uh, maybe I was probably making like two thousand five hundred a month consistently. Uh, and most importantly, I had the kind of flexible lifestyle and family friendly business that I wanted. But then 2020 came <laughs> March 2020 specifically. Covid hit and I hit an all time low. I think there was one month. And obviously, if there are any parents in here, you know, all the nurseries, all the childcare schools, everything closed. And so you're suddenly trying to figure out how to work full time and also parent full time. Impossible. I essentially mostly stopped working at one point. I think there was one month where I made something like 300 pounds in profit. (laughs) I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh, this is potentially the end. But the nurseries opened back up in July. And although things weren't, you know, perfect. I made it work. By the end of 2020, September, Octoberish time, I was hitting 10K consistently. And today, three years later, I have plus one more baby <laughs> um, who is, he's one now. And I have a six figure copywriting business. This business has changed my life. I know people talk about six figure business, blah, 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 like who cares, right? It's all about how that stuff actually changes your life. Like what does that actually mean? So for me, this business has allowed me to self-fund seven to eight months of maternity leave. Um, As you know, as a self-employed person, I had to really figure that out by myself. My business helped me do that. I only worked seven months in 2022 um, this, my, my first six figure year. And, um, that includes taking off all of July. So there were the first three months, uh, January, February, and March, no, January, February, I took off completely. That was part of my maternity leave. Um, I took off more, I took off multiple, um, different kind of weeks off one to travel to uh, Spain to do a, an email talk in Spain another for a family, um, kind of trip away. I took all of July off just to enjoy the summer, and so, and oh, of course, there were all those weeks as well that I took off when my, when the baby was sick because <laughs> of all those nursery viruses. So this is really a business that allows me to be the mom that I want to be, to have the life that I want to be. Yes, of course, we all know there are those nights where, you know, you got to work late and it's not as glamorous as it seems on the outside, but all in all, I'm really happy with the business I've created. Um, still loads to work on, still lots of, you know, um, evolving to do. But when I look back on kind of what what I what I have now, 
I'm happy with it. So this is why I'm talking to you today about how to kick ass as a freelancer. The six different steps I'm going to talk about. The first one is stop being an order taker. Now, I was an order taker. That's why I can say this to you. <laughs> my business was what I like to call a McDonald's drive through where clients would just kind of stroll up at my window and be like, I want a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this. I, my business was probably worse than McDonald's because McDonald's at least has a menu for people to choose from. I would just be like, I will, I will do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> you want a brochure? I'll do it. You want a poster? I'll do it. You want a website? I'll do that too. I really had, um, I mean, the goal was just to make money. So whatever came to me, I would take. And it wasn't just that. It was the fact that I'd take on these clients and then the clients would tell me what to do throughout the entire project. They would tell me what to write about, um, what, you know, why I need to write about it instead of me taking control and deciding what needs to be written for the client that's hired me to write the thing. And all this changed when I started to position myself as a strategist. So that's one of the first things I have to advise is that you position yourself as a strategist. When I was the order taker, my rates were low. My clients barely respected me, <laughs> honestly. Um, but today I'm in a totally different position and it's because of this. Now there's a copywriter in the copywriting world called Joel Kletke. And he said this thing that has always stuck with me. And he said it years ago, but it stayed with me. He said, people don't pay you to write. They pay you to think. And I want you to swap whatever you do, like swap the word write for whatever you do. Because when it comes to my industry, everyone can physically write physically, which gives a lot of people the impression that everyone can just write, <laughs> that everyone can do what I do. And so at the beginning of my career, my business, I was coming up against a struggle where everybody thought they could do what I could do. And they thought they were hiring me because they just didn't have time to do it themselves, which is so not true. But once I started positioning myself as a strategist, the person who does the thinking, the person who knows all the kind of the, the theory and the reasoning behind why I, I do what I do, that's when everything really started to change for me. So I want you to think about how you can demonstrate how you think. How can you demonstrate that you're able to think in a way that your clients can't? Because it's this that differentiates you from the other people who do what you do. And it's this that attracts your ideal clients, the people that really gel with you. Because if you're showing them how you think, you're attracting clients who are happy with how you think, <laughs> who are going to be um, pleased with the work that you produce because you've already showed them how you think. You've, you've already got that kind of buy-in. This is how you demonstrate that that you're the expert and it's how you get clients to trust you and to trust that you are the expert because I've been the client on the other side it's easy to ask for clients to trust you but it's it's a really hard thing for them to do and so you they need to be sure that they can trust you and this is one of the ways to do that it's also how you charge a whole lot more <laughs> because in my case I'm no longer a pen for hire I am a strategist and I want you to think about how you can change that position. And so your clients stop thinking about you as the person I'm hiring because I don't have time to do it myself. Like I totally could, but I just don't have time. So I'm going to hire you. No, they're hiring you because you're doing what they can't do. So here's what I do to position myself as a strategist. First of all, I actually call myself a strategist. <laughs> so I rebranded. I know it sounds super simple, but it's so important. I rebranded and I, I stopped calling myself just a copywriter and I, I now call, call myself an email strategist and copywriter and note the strategist comes first for a couple of reasons number one because strategy comes before copy <laughs> and number two because I want the emphasis on the strategist side of things I'm not just a copywriter um I, I am the person who does your strategy and I say that because there are a lot of copywriters who don't yet have the confidence they're growing, they'll get there, but maybe they don't yet have the confidence to 
call themselves a strategist, even though maybe they are doing the strategy behind the scenes. And then there are others who just completely don't do the strategy like me, like I did initially, and who just takes orders. So it does make a difference. And I, I am then attracting clients who want someone who want someone to do the thinking for them, who are willing to pay more. So this person will do the thinking for them. I publish email teardowns. So I have this email teardown that I did uh, for Kylie Cosmetics. That's Kylie Jenner's um, like billion dollar cosmetics company. And basically I, I signed up to Kylie Cosmetics emails and then I did an audit through them. I recorded this audit. Um, I went through like what they're doing really well, what they're doing terribly, what they need to improve. And then I published it online. And it's one of the most popular pieces of content that I've produced. Um, I have been asked to go on podcasts because of it. I have gained clients because of it. And it's purely because I'm just telling people, I'm showing people how I think. Instead of saying I'm an email strategist and copywriter, I'm showing you I'm an email strategist and here's how I think. Here's what I can do for you. Um, I also do Loom strategy walkthroughs for clients. So for the clients that do hire me, when I'm delivering work, I don't just deliver the copy and just give it to them and hope that they get it. Um, I actually walk them through it. And usually this is a maybe 30 minute video where I'm walking them through my strategy. I'm helping them understand why I've chosen to do exactly what I'm doing. And while you might think this feels like, you know, a client might not want to watch a 30 minute video. I promise you clients obviously love their own businesses and they love other people. They love hearing other people talk about their businesses. One of my clients said to me, your Loom walkthrough is like one of my favorite things. I love them so much. And it's helping them to understand that, yes, a lot of work has gone into this. Your investment was um, worth it. And here's here are all the things I know that you don't know that made this investment a, a, the right decision for you. And then again, in everything that I do, I position myself as the expert. And all of this is what allows me to. And, and this is why I suggest you position yourself as a strategist, no matter what your field is. Number two, create a five-star client experience. So this is a topic I could talk about all day and all night um, because I've just always been really passionate about customer service. And I thought this was a thing that just everyone was passionate about. Uh, but I've recently <laughs> realized it is not. <laughs> it is not. And some people don't even think about this. For me, this is this is fun. Um, creating a five-star client experience is so important because, I mean, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is, again, you get to charge more simply because you're creating a nicer experience for your clients. And number two, it's easier for you to get referrals because clients love working with you. So they're raving about you and they're telling other people about you. And number three, you just get to feel really good about the fact that your clients feel good. I don't know if anyone watches or is as addicted as I am to like all these real estate shows, but there's a show on Netflix called The Parisian Agency. If you're a fan of selling Sunset or any of those like friend, like uh, spinoff shows, you will love this. I personally think The Parisian Agency is way better than selling Sunset because this is about a family real estate business. It's so wholesome. They're French. Everything is in French. It's subtitled. It's brilliant. And they show people around houses at, around France and in one of these episodes one of the brothers I can't remember which one but one of the brother, brothers said a viewing doesn't begin when you open the door and a viewing doesn't end when you close the door a viewing is an experience so what they do with their clients is they take them out to dinner <laughs> instead of um, saying to the client look I'll meet you at the house here's the address they fly the client in <laughs> on, you know, helicopter rides and boat rides and they do pickups from the airport. They don't need to pick the client up from the airport, but they do it anyway. They go the extra mile. They have a yearly client party at their house that all their clients look forward to, super exclusive. And it makes their clients feel really good and, and they get to give back to their clients in that way. They remember like really small details about their clients and ask about their families and, you know, how's this and how's that? If it's a repeat client, oh, how did, how is that house that I sold you good? Okay, great. You know, and this isn't about having loads of money and being really lavish because even uh, there was a, a, a client who came on who was ex Miss France and she only had a budget of uh, 1,500 euros for rent, which is not a lot in Paris. Um, but they still treated her like she was a luxury client, like all the rest of their VIP clients. And so, 
I'm not saying <laughs> that you have to, you know, uh, put your clients on boat rides and helicopter rides, but just thinking about working with you as being an experience that can be an enjoyable experience rather than just, oh, you paid them to do the work. Here's the work. Thanks. Goodbye. It creates a whole new level of, um, just, it just creates a whole new level for your clients and for you as well. And so part of this is about leading your clients. You can create a five-star experience by leading your clients because clients want and need a leader. Now, this is what I was unable to do uh, when I was an order taker. <laughs> and a lot of people are unable to do this because they're scared to lead their clients because leading your clients means that you then have to be responsible and accountable <laughs> for where you take your clients. And it is a scary thing, but I guess that part comes with, you know, experience and confidence and all that good stuff. But the truth is you need to be confident in leading your clients and guiding them because your clients reflect you. When you're confident, they're confident. When you're unsure, they're unsure about you. <laughs> and they want you to lead them. They want you to challenge them. That's what they're paying you for. I work with clients who are multi six and seven plus figure business owners. But when it comes to the stuff that I do, they have no clue. Um, and so they want me to tell them when their ideas or their strategies aren't the greatest. <laughs> they want me to come in. That's what they're paying me for. And so when you can lead your clients instead of allowing them to lead you, that's part of creating a great five-star experience. Uh, Another part of this is the ability to ease friction and make absolutely everything easy. I'm talking a seamless experience for your client from the moment they um, find you and are in your kind of world to the to them leaving and not just them leaving and offboarding on their way out, like even after that experience of, of, of offboarding, you want to avoid anything that's annoying or difficult for your client, don't create friction where you see friction in your processes or in your onboarding and your delivery and your offboarding, any of that in your intake, even before they come clients, you want to remove the friction. Um, because again, you want to make it seamless. My number one principle is make it easy for the client. How do I make everything as easy as possible for them? Because hiring me should not create more work for them. Things should be easier for them. And where there is more work, for example, in my kind of briefing process where they need to fill out a questionnaire that might take them an hour, they're already prepared for that. I've prepared them for that. I've told them about that on the sales call before they've given me any money. So they know that, look, the beginning of this process is going to be a little hard for you because they require you to do a bunch of stuff and send me a bunch of stuff but after that is done and that's over the rest is easy for you and I mentioned things like if you remember when we talked about the Parisian agency I said they remember small details about their clients and it's impressive because the details really do matter you might think like this small thing doesn't matter and this small thing doesn't matter but they matter because those details like add up and make up the whole project those details are the project, the experience of working with you. And so let's talk about how to make everything easy. It's as simple as if you're booking calls, use a booking tool like Calendly. I um, recently had someone send me some dates uh, that we could, you know, potentially get on a call and there was no booking tool. So I opened the email and I immediately closed the email because I've got to now go to my calendar, figure out when I'm free. Like it's all manual work. It's difficult. And now it's another task on my many, many things to do, right? So make things easy for them. So it's just the click of a button. If they're signing proposals, use um, a, a tool that allows them to, to actually sign the thing. Like if you're sending them something to sign, make it easy for them to sign the thing. Don't make it hard for them to sign the thing. <laughs> if, you're, have, if you have someone who's paying invoices, send invoices with easy instructions. Don't ever make your client ask for the invoice. Like, hey, what about that invoice? Can you send it over? They shouldn't ever have to follow up, right? That's not their job. It's your job. Um, and this is the really big one for me. Um, give into the Stripe fees, just give into them <laughs> and accept that it's just another business expense that is worth paying because it makes it easy for your clients to pay you instead of having to open up their bank banking details and do a bank transfer because you want to avoid some fees. Well, these are the things you kind of need to consider when you're coming up with your pricing in the first place. So you shouldn't really be feeling those fees because hopefully it's something that you've already 
thought about and we're going to talk about that soon if you haven't um in terms of like you know you're just getting off a call if you have action points from the call instead of expecting your client to write these things down and remember these things just send them a follow-up email in the call with the action point so that they don't have to do things like that. It's so simple. And these things, yes, are so small, but again, it's the details that matter. Clients might not necessarily be able to verbalize why it's so easy and enjoyable working with you, but it's all of these things that make it easy and enjoyable to work with you. And this one is my favorite, create moments. So there are certain moments in a project that are moments with a capital M. For example, when a client pays your invoice and officially becomes your client, that's a moment for your client. When your customer shares an amazing review, um, or when a customer shares an amazing review in invoice of customer research, for example. So if I've sent out surveys where I am surveying my client's customers, if someone says something absolutely amazing about my client, I want to make my client smile that day. I might take a screenshot of that and send it to them and say, hey, so this person said this really amazing thing about you, just wanted to make you smile, here you go. That's a moment. Another moment is the delivery of, of the project itself. It's a moment. For us, it's not because we do these things every day, <laughs> you know, day in, day out. It's just, it's, it's another thing that we do. So for your client who invested in you, it's a moment. So celebrate those moments, make those moments memorable for the clients and show them that you really appreciate them. My moments, uh, these are some examples of my own moments that I create for my clients. When a client signs on to work with me, I send them a small gift. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, huge. Uh, at the beginning, when I didn't really have the funds to do this, I'd send them a thank you note, like a, a written thank you note. And then generally what would happen is the client would take a picture of the thank you note, send, uh, you know, tag me on Instagram, share it. I'd get more followers, more people knowing who I am doesn't have to cost money. It's the thought that counts. When I have a new client, I'll give them a shout out on my social media or my newsletter. Again, these moments don't have to cost money. Again, when I send over the final project, I don't just send it over and say, thanks, bye. I send over this detailed walkthrough that shows them that I really care and a lot of thought went into this. And when we're offboarding, I schedule a wrap-up call just to make sure that they feel like the, everything is wrapped up so that any additional questions, thoughts, concerns, worries they have can be addressed before we wrap things up. Does this mean you have to fork out money for extra tools and systems? Yes, it does. <laughs> because the truth is, if you don't even want to invest in your business, how do you expect clients to invest in your business? So if you're not willing to invest in the like in Stripe fees um, or even just a booking tool that makes your life a whole lot easier and your client's life a whole lot easier. How do you expect your clients to want to invest in you? Doesn't mean you have to fork out extra money for all the tools and systems. Prioritize the ones that will make your client's lives easier because it really does make a difference. And another tip is to just is to raise your rates to cover some of these fees. It doesn't have to be a huge hike, just a little to help you cover, uh, you know, the price of some of these tools and systems. And I have to attribute this to uh, Mickley. I've posted her, I've, I've posted a screenshot here of her Instagram in case you want to go follow her. This is all her. So I had all these ideas about customer experience and she just encapsulated them all. And I was like blown away by this customer experience hierarchy. So at the bottom of this pyramid, you do the very necessary. You just, what's necessary. You make sure the client has what they need, which is good. A lot of freelancers don't bother to do that. <laughs> so that is good. But then you go a step up and you make things easy. You reduce the friction. Honestly, I was blown away. It was like Mickley was in my mind. She just like, she really encapsulated everything that I've been harping on about. And then the next step is delight moments, create moments, celebrate them, make them smile. I just wanted to really quickly share something that my client said, because she really said all the things that I believe in when it comes to creating this experience for my clients. I didn't ask her to say any of this. She just said it. And I was like, I, I felt so um, validated and unhappy that she realized that this is, this is what I believe. And this is what I was truly trying to create for her. She said, um, I do a slick job with customer experience. And if I'm super honest, it's rare to find someone whose processes are so slick and my communication is so on point. I was never thinking, where are we at? What's happening? What's going on? I love that because it means that she felt secure in working with me. She always knew what was going on. And she always felt like I had everything under control. 
which is good. That's how you want your clients to feel. That is a five-star customer experience. Three, be intentional with your pricing. So use pricing methods that benefit both you and your clients. So my personal experience is that hourly pricing punishes you for being good at your job. So the better you are, the faster you're able to do your work, the less you get paid. And so for me, hourly pricing has has not worked. And I know that it can work sometimes depending on, you know, the arrangement you have with the client. So I'm not saying that you don't ever use it, but for me in my situation, it didn't work. And often the case is that it's punishing you for being good at your job. I prefer project-based pricing, value-based pricing where, you know, we all know at the beginning what the price is going to be. The client knows at the beginning what the price is going to be. And also it's not, my pricing isn't always about the work that I'm doing. It's also about the value that the client is getting. Like how many times can they use that work? Because often I'm writing copy where I've written it one time, sure, but the client gets to put it out in the world forever. And, you know, they launch it two, three times a year and they're making money off it more than one time. So let's stop just thinking about the work that you're putting in and start thinking about what is the actual value for the client. And I, again, I'm not against time-based offers, but if you use them, I use them sometimes, but they should be super intentional. It shouldn't be because you don't know how else to price your stuff. It should be because you actually want to create a time-based offer. In terms of being able to create intentional pricing, one way to do that is to reverse engineer your pricing based on your needs and wants. So instead of just having like random prices, random pricing strategies, you're actually calculating how much you need to earn so you can live comfortably. And it's not always just about like, what do I need to live? Like, what do I want to live? Like, how much money do I need so that I can live a life that I'm happy with, that I'm comfortable with? So once you have that figure, then you figure out, okay, well, if I want to make that yearly, if I want to make that monthly, here's what my service suite has to be. Here's what my prices have to be. I have to sell X amount of those a month in order to meet those financial goals. Intentional pricing. And don't forget to cover things like your business expenses and your taxes. This is where a lot of freelancers uh, make a, a huge mistake is that you forget that a good portion of the money that you make isn't actually yours. <laughs> it goes to your taxes and it also goes to your business expenses. So when you start thinking again, like a business owner and you start thinking about these things and planning these things, it means that you're able to, again, create pricing that is reflective of the life that you want to live and the amount of money that you need so that you, you can live. Um, remember that for every invoice you send, oh, I already said that. Okay. This, all of this should impact your pricing decisions. All of, all of these are things to consider when you're pricing your stuff. I, for example, um, put aside 20, no, 25% of every invoice that goes straight into my taxes. So that's a big consideration for me when I'm pricing my stuff, because 25% of that already isn't mine. Another 20% goes to business expenses. So that's 45% that is not mine. So now I'm really considering <laughs> what my prices are and how much I'm making per project. Find your sweet spot. There is no right or wrong way to do this in terms of figuring out your pricing and which pricing strategies to choose. I personally know that I like my services and offers to be in the 1,500 to 15,000 range. I know that's a big range, but 1,500 is like my minimum. Um, and that's, that's a productized service. So I have an email conversion audit where I audit people's emails um, and it's 1,500. That's the lowest thing. That's the lowest amount that anyone can pay me. And my projects tend to go up to 12, 15,000. Um, I have a friend who is really good at selling low price products. Her lowest uh, offer and her most popular offer is $9.99. And that made me stop and think and think, should I be lowering my prices? Like, should I, should I have a lower offer for the people who want to work with me who maybe can't hit, you know, my higher range of offers? And the answer is no. I am good at selling higher prices. I enjoy it. I find it, honestly, I probably find it a little easier than selling those lower priced products. My friend is great at selling her $9.99 products and that's amazing for her, but it's not right for me. So think about what works best for you and you only. Number four, qualify, qualify, qualify. 
by this, I mean, qualify your leads before you take time to get on a call with them and speak to them before you invest your energy, your time, your, your thoughts on them. And I know that sounds harsh, but you have to be, you have to protect your energy, your space, your time. Time is money for us, right? You're searching for as many leads as possible when in fact you should be searching for the right leads. So we're not trying to talk to as many people as possible. We're just trying to talk to the right people. You want to stop wasting your time talking to the wrong people. (laughs) Here's how I don't talk to the wrong people. I only have two or three sales calls a month. Now, if someone had said that to me back in 2018, I'd have been very concerned because I was looking to have, you know, 15, 10, 15 calls a month. Like that for me is, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. People know me, people want to work with me. That's not where I'm at anymore. The key thing here is that when I have those two to three sales calls a month, I land those two to three sales. uh, I land those two to three calls, right? So the majority of those turn into projects. It's hard to get on a sales call with me. And when I say sales call, I mean discovery call, whatever you call your call. It's hard to get on a call with me because I have two kids at home and I'm just tired all the time. So I don't have time (laughs) to be on calls with people that I can't help. I would rather find someone who really can help you so you can get on a call with them instead. When people want to work with me, they have to fill in a contact form and it doesn't matter where they come from. Um, I had someone recently who got in touch who seemed really lovely um, and was like, hey, I'm interested in working with you. Can we get on a call? And it seemed, I mean, maybe it's because I'm, oh, I think it's the British thing where we're just, we're just so polite. It can sometimes feel a little bit rude to be like, hey, you know, thanks so much for getting in touch. Um, actually, if you could fill in this form first, that will help me figure out if I can help you. If I can help you, we'll get on a call. If I can't, I'll try to find someone who can help you. It can feel a little bit like, oh, can I really say that? But yes, I can, because guess what? She filled out the form and immediately realized that I can't help her and she can't pay my rates. So I've just saved myself. It's a 30 minute call, sure. But actually, really, it's more like an hour when you think about the preparation, the sitting down in your chair, getting ready for the call, all that stuff. Because of my pricing, this works for me. I only need to land two clients a month, really, to have a good month, to be happy. And so I want you to start thinking about how many clients you need to speak to or how many things you need to sell really in order to hit your financial goals. And again, this all ties back into pricing strategies. This works for me because of my pricing. I want you to think about what you could do with all that extra time when you no longer have five sales calls a week, when you're no longer spending hours creating proposals for people who don't have the budget to hire you. You could not be working. You could be spending more time with your kids, your family, your friends. You could dedicate more time to marketing and find clients who can actually pay you. Number five, prepare for quiet periods. We're also done. For me, this was one of the keys to uh, my business success, quite frankly. It was realizing and just accepting that there are going to be quiet periods. There are going to be busy periods and quiet periods. It's just the nature of having a business. There are seasons of busyness in business and there are seasons of just quiet, right? So once I accepted that, it meant that I could start preparing for that. It meant that I realized I can never stop marketing, especially when I'm busy. Because one of the traps of business is that you find yourself super busy and you're like, oh, fantastic. I've got all this work and all this money and everything's great. And I don't need to market anymore. I'm so busy on this. I don't have time to market right now. And then that project finishes or that work finishes and you're done. And then you look up and you've got no work, no clients, no money coming in. And it's just tumbleweed. And that's a really big problem. (laughs) And it's it's a trap that so many of us fall into. I used to all the time, but because I accepted the idea of just business being, you know, uh, seasonal, um, because that's just the way business is. It meant I could start preparing for it. One thing I started doing was working on building up my savings for this. And it's, it's really hard. And initially like my savings <laughs> would, couldn't get past, you know, a few hundred even, but even that really helps because it means that you can, you are able to start saying no to clients that aren't the right fit so that you can say yes to the ones that really are. I also prioritize, excuse the typo, I also prioritize retention over acquisition. It's so much 
easier to keep working with the same clients over and over again instead of trying to go out and find new clients. And I know we know this, but do you really practice it? Do you really practice it? (laughs) Because it's one of those things that we all know, but so many of us do not do. Instead of searching for clients all the time, I'm looking for opportunities within the projects I'm already working on with the clients I'm already working with where I can help them further, where I can pitch another project. I just started one project uh, a couple of weeks ago. I had the kind of briefing call, the onboarding process for that. And on that call, I pitched them another project. I was like, you really need this, to be honest, if we want this to work. And they were like, okay, yeah, let's do it. So great. <laughs> That's another project that I have. And I'm I'm still looking for more opportunities to pitch them on other stuff I can be doing. Because again, that five-star client experience means these clients love working with me. And that means they are happy to continue working with me and to continue investing in me. Retention over acquisition. The result, no more feast and famine. When those quiet periods do come, you have money to tide you over so that you can not panic and not worry and want to shut your business down. You'll realize that you really are making progress instead of blaming yourself and thinking you're doing something wrong because you're having these things fe- like ups and downs, this like roller coaster. Um, you'll realize that you're not doing anything wrong and you are a good business owner. And knowing that just frees you and liberates you and allows you to just be more confident in what you're doing. And the final thing before we go on to Q&A is six, learn from your mistakes. I believe in this so much that I created an entire podcast around it, Mistakes That Made Me, the podcast that asks extraordinary business owners to share their biggest business mistake. I, I'm i interviewing business owners that are making millions on this podcast. Some are, some aren't, but all of them say the same thing, that making making the big mistake that they made really helped them to get to where they are today. It was necessary. Those mistakes were absolutely necessary for them to get to where they are today. And so the point is that it's okay to make mistakes. Mistakes do not have to be your downfall. Really the determining factor as to whether those mistakes are your downfall is how you respond to your mistakes. So if you can reframe the way you think about making business mistakes and start thinking that, you know, I'm gonna make mistakes. It's okay for me to make mistakes. What's not okay is for me to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm super excited to take your questions. Joe, I never actually asked you, am I allowed to share my like uh, lead magnet with everyone in my email <laughs> list? Hell yeah, you are. Of course you are. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, so obviously what I do is create great emails and email strategy for business owners who want to make money from their emails and also just create better relationships with their subscribers. Um, And so I want to share my 35 minute crash course in email marketing. It's free. I know you don't have a lot of time, which is why it's only 35 minutes, but it'll teach you how to boost your conversions and sales through email. So I'm going to share this link with you once you're once you sign up, you'll get this crash course. And you'll also sign up to my newsletter where I'm sharing business ideas and tips and advice like this all the time so I hope you'll join me over on my newsletter (laughs) honestly oh thank you so much what a a truly outstanding session I really appreciated um the practicality the thoughtfulness and like honestly you you just you radiate such positive energy I just want to take um a few of the comments here because uh, they will make your head explode with with pure ego uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got claire who says i need to re-watch this three times so much value we've got emily super useful thank you so much we've got wonderful thank you we've got awesome presentation very uh, inspirational i want to take the one from nicole that i saw earlier uh, so we've got one from catherine i'm not a freelancer but this may feel filled me with so much more confidence for my general oh, work and good. Nicole we've got no wonder you're doing so well man you're amazing so like thank honestly you. <laughs> it was really really outstanding so thank you so much that was very 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 good thank you uh, for having me thank you for watching everyone and oh, feel free to screenshot us and tag me at Iman Copico. <laughs> I love it you're a pro I love it we've got um we've got 22 open questions so like we wow we should uh, try and uh, get our way through them. Folks, uh, watch it. Uh, if you give a thumbs up to the questions you want answering, then we'll make sure we, we prioritize uh, those ones. Um, and let's take the first one from actually the Mysterious Anonymous. Um, and it was probably back to the beginning of your story of 2018, where you were sort of saying about taking the leap and, 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 and uh, going freelance. So 
Uh, the question is, what safety nets did you have? Uh, was it spouse slash family or did you make the leap without any other income streams? And I guess the crux of all of this question is, when can you take the leap? or When did you feel comfortable taking the leap? Uh, going That's into? such a great question. Um, I, I feel like I can't say, you know, when is a good time to take the leap? Uh, but for me, my safety net was having my uncle. I mean, I was at this charity and wasn't having the greatest <laughs> time at the, at the time. And my uncle spoke to me and said, you will quit this job and you will start a business and you will be successful. <laughs> so having him speak to me and really sit me down and say, you don't need to worry. Nothing terrible is going to happen to you. You're not going to be homeless. You're not going to be without food. Your son is always going to have food. Um, you know, your family is supporting you. I have the most incredibly supportive family. Um, saying that, I am not a person who likes to ask for help. So um, I never did ask them for money. My mom paid for my logo. She paid, she gave me 250 pounds for my first ever logo. Um, and my mom also, I wanted to join a, a course to, um, you know, upskill. And my mom loaned me the the money and I paid her back monthly. Um, and so ha just knowing that I could do this, I always knew that I wasn't going to ask them for money, but knowing that I could do this and that nothing terrible would happen was, um, I mean, a privilege that a lot of people don't have. So great question. And hopefully that uh, answered it. I love that very, very much. Um, and there was a, we don't usually take questions from the chat, but I think it was a good one from Kev um, that came in about confidence. Um, and like, I, without meaning to put this upon you, like uh, sort of looking at you today, you've spoken with confidence and you've, you present yourself with confidence. Have you always been this way or are there moments <laughs> where you can reflect and go, ah, oh, you know, actually this was really important for me sort of becoming more comfortable or confident in, in this journey? Really, really interesting because people have a hard time believing that I was in therapy for years for anxiety and depression and all sorts. And, and so I feel like there's a split. I don't know if there's a difference between confidence and self-esteem. I don't know if that's what it is, but um, I guess I've always, I've always loved speaking. I've always loved, uh, you know, talking to people, giving talks and things like that. So that's, that's one side of it. And then there's the other side where it's, there's inner work to do. <laughs> so yes, I've, I've always been a person who has been on stages. I used to do a lot of performing, which is probably part of the, this, I think I'm wanting to, you know, uh, speak and enjoying speaking, but no, um, there's work to be done as well. There's work that I've had to do, I think. And I don't, it's so difficult to answer that question. Well, it's what, so difficult to answer that question, but I hope that was helpful. <laughs> what I what I take from it is that, you know, so you pointed to an example there of like um, something you feel confident and comfortable doing in, in speaking and so on and so forth. And then, exactly. and then you, you also sort of mentioned there is work to be done, which I think speaks to so many of us in that we find our strong points we can do those things and then there's other things that we work on right and whether it's exactly. pricing like I was terrified of sending contracts for example at the beginning like that was a thing for me um wow. having the confidence to do that was really important so um so thank you for sharing that and um, I hope you don't mind that question <laughs> no it was a great question thank you for asking <laughs> um so let's take a, a little bit more of a one closer to the the freelancing world uh which is from alex who has been on uh, her own journey of, of incredible uh freelancing stuff which has been great to see uh so alex asks do you have clients on retainer or one-off projects uh and how do those on retainer accept you taking weeks off at a time great question so um last year i did not have any clients on retainers um this year i do uh, so in terms of taking time off, I'm just making sure that the work gets done. And honestly, it's again, all about customer experience, communication, <laughs> communicating with your clients and letting them know I'm going to be away this period. And here's how it's not going to affect you at all. <laughs> and the thing is, is I, th I think some people feel nervous about telling clients when they're going to take time off. I don't at all because it's not their business. <laughs> what their business is, is getting what they paid for and getting it in a timely manner. And so 
in terms of taking a lot of time off last year, um, I did have some cases where, although I didn't have retainer clients, I had ongoing clients that hire me over and over again because retention over acquisition. And so I'd have this issue where, not really issue, but this, you know, situation where clients would be like, great, want to hire you again. And I'm like, fantastic. I'll be back in a month. So <laughs> we can schedule that in then. And so while I didn't experience that necessarily, that was something to navigate. And it all for me came down to communication. Again, making things as easy as possible for the client, letting them know why and how this isn't going to affect them. And just making sure that I'm planning in advance. Um, my calendar is so... Um, I don't want to say organized because it's not, it's more just like (laughs) everything that is in my brain is on that calendar. If it's not on the calendar, it doesn't exist. And so I'm able to plan this in advance. And also that's another thing. I do plan the time off in advance. At the beginning of the year, I sit down and I put in my holidays at the beginning, right at the beginning of the year. So I already know that I want to take July off. So that's out. And now I'm looking at, okay, when am I going to need breaks? Not because I'm burnt out and I'm like, oh my God, I need to take a week off. But no, because I have a planned break that I planned back in January. So I'm I'm very intentional about the time that I take off. And then if there are periods where I can take time off as well, I will do that. Like Even if it's just a day, even if it's just a day, um, I will do that when possible. Nice. I love that. And so we've got Alex who asked the question saying, yes, not their business if you take uh, time. Love it. Um, and like this, this part of this, like it strikes me that one of your early points was about being a strategist rather than the the order taker. So presumably that mindset really helps with this taking the time off as well, right? It does. It really does. And I think my clients see that and my clients as well are, um, it's so interesting because I often work with clients who talk a lot about um having people respect your boundaries and stuff like that and then they have to live that in practice with me and I have to live that in practice with with them and so it helps because they see me as I'm a business owner who takes my business very seriously and here's what that looks like bang on so we've got Nicola uh in the chat here saying that is so true it's up to us to manage our time and deliver what we're contracted to do not our clients businesses what we do with our time love it off to plan my leave thanks i love it i I can also speak to this as a business owner i love it when my freelancers tell me what to do like i'm bringing you in to to your expertise so like if you say okay you can do this this and this and this is a really good idea oh and by the way i'm away next week like i'm like fine gravy you know let's let's work with that you know it's it's that works so much better as a proactive approach rather than the other way around so uh, absolutely everything you've uh spoken to as well um Let's take a question, uh, also from Alex, actually, but like it's one that is mirrored throughout the Q&A um, with about six questions dedicated to it, which is, uh, where do you get the majority of your leads from? Um, and I'd be interested also if this has changed over the course of time, like whether you started off with a different approach and, and you've got one uh, that's slightly different these days. Yeah, well, it started off um, that I would get most of my leads from LinkedIn, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found that leads are not clients. <laughs> so <laughs> when I started actually analyzing where my clients came from, as opposed to leads, mm-hmm. um, it was word of mouth referral always, no matter what I do, <laughs> word of mouth referral always comes out on top. And there was a time that I was a little bit frustrated about that because it made me think, well, what about all my marketing efforts? Like what is nothing else coming out on top? Um, but actually I decided to accept that and lean into it. And so now I have a part of my process is asking for existing asking existing clients to refer me to people they know and I'm very specific about it it's not just like oh hey um I'd love for you to refer me it's hey I've absolutely loved working with you I want to work with more people like you so do you know even just one person who could do with hiring me so that I can help them with their emails like I've helped you and that's that's the request, super specific. And also a little complimentary. Um, I'll always let the client know that, you know, I I love them. And, you know, one client said to me, I'm, I, I'm happy to refer you. I've already started referring you out, but please let me know that if you get booked out, you'll always give me first priority. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's their worry that you'll get booked out, that, you know, you won't have any more time for them. And I actually do always give that, that client priority booking first. Um, So that's, it's always word of mouth referral, but I do a lot of marketing stuff. I do a lot of speaking, a lot of webinars. Um, 
I go on a lot of podcasts. I find that I get leads from my podcast interviews, like guest post- podcasting on other people's, which is fantastic. Um, and probably my Instagram as well. Um, I love Instagram. I, I I love stories more than the grid. I hate the grid. Love stories. <laughs> and I think the stories allows people to get to know me. So for people who are maybe thinking about working with me, they follow me on Instagram and think, okay, I can gel with her personality and then tend to get in touch. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. that. Thank you. That's that's so so good. And like, there's there's a, a chat comment here from from uh, Nicole, uh, which says even as an agency, most of our work comes from existing slash former client referrals. Uh, to your point, and like yeah. I've also had that experience. You know, um, and I, I actually did it with you in, in a way. You know, which is I saw you on the magazine cover with uh, Freelancer Magazine with Sophie. And then I went mm-hmm. to your podcast and stuff like that. And so those tools are used rather than an awareness tool. They're used as more like a, a, a consideration thing to reinforce your your authority and all that sort of stuff rather than the other Yes. And, and I think that's really important to say. I Sometimes I think, I don't know if it's any one thing. I think it's all these things working together. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. absolutely. Bang on. No, you're so right. You're so right. And that's why attribution is so hard. And also why well, you need to be doing all this stuff which is sometimes difficult because mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, let's take one last question. There's so many, and there was actually a, um, a very lovely comment here. Uh, I just want to read, with no disrespect to any of the other webinar guests, and this is from Ant- Antoinette, uh, we've heard from, I think this has been the most useful and best webinar yet for me. So that's three oh, years there. So thank you. you definitely wow. Can um let's take this last one from amy uh, and then we'll close out uh so amy asks and it's it's, a, it's an issue of uh practicality and, and realism it says honestly do clients w- not want an order taker do they just want someone to take stuff off their plate and so um right back to the beginning but first of all hey amy um <laughs> and the thing is is some clients do want an order taker Some clients really do want an order taker. Some clients want to hire someone and tell them what they need to do. The question is, do you want to be an order taker? (laughs) Do you want those clients who want an order taker to hire you? That is the question. You want to go find those very real clients who don't want an order taker, who want a strategist, who want someone to take their, um, you know, all that, the things that they're struggling with off their plate and then the next question becomes well how do you find those clients and that is a whole entire different <laughs> webinar <laughs> well you're welcome back whenever you would like uh, to, <laughs> to <you>. <laughs> okay. um wonderful honestly thank you so much I, I really feel like we've ended this season with such a burst of positivity and practicality you, you've delivered a hundred times over uh, on what anyone could have expected from you so thank you so much uh, for today and uh thank you also everyone for the chat today you know you've, you've you've all been outstanding and throughout this season uh it's been just just lovely so thank you for today thank you thank for the- you joe yes can i just say one thing because i saw a question um about maternity leave and i just want to point everyone to the the emily thompson um podcast interview that I did with being boss um where I spoke about my maternity plan the plan and putting it in action and also getting back to business after my seven eight months of maternity leave so uh the podcast is called being boss and it's the episode with me about maternity leave so I hope that answers the question and for anyone else who's interested in just taking time off like how to take time off how to plan it that's incredible thank you I, I listened to that and it was great it was really 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 great so thank, thank you, you. Um, thanks everyone Thank you. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks online and hopefully in person uh, a lot sooner than that. Uh, See you later and take care, everyone. Bye.